So, um, so last time we saw that uh, the discrete Fourier transform is nothing but a change of basis, right? Uh, we had two bases, uh, uh, say uh, B, which consisted of the usual vectors. So we are working in um, two, with tuples of real or complex numbers, right? Uh, 0, 1, 0, 0, and so forth. The last one is, of course, 0, 0, 0, and then 1. So that's the usual basis of uh, C to the N or R to the N for of C to the N and uh, R to the N, of course, depending on whether if you allow only real or also <coughs> complex scalars, right? So what does a vector look like in these spaces? Well, clearly, vector uh, x, right, which is equal to x0, x1, up to xn minus 1, can be written in the form uh, x0 times vector 1, 0, 0, 0, plus x1, 0, 1, 0, 0, plus all the way xn minus 1 times 0, 0, uh, 0, 1, right? But what are uh, x, what is x0? How do you get x0 from vector x? This is simply projection, okay, let's call this vector, this will be E0, this will be E1, and this will be E n minus 1. So we wrote our um, uh, vector x as sum when k goes from 0 to n minus 1, xi times uh, E i, right? But what is, how do you get x i? x i is nothing but, so notice, x i is simply the scalar product of x with E i, right? Because what is this? Uh, this is equal to uh, the sum of uh, uh, of uh, uh, x uh, uh, j uh, j okay so let me just uh, write it in a more compact form so um, we have that uh, uh, x i is equal to the uh, sum, right, of uh, uh, x k coordinate uh, times e i k coordinate, right? When k goes from 0 to n minus 1. But what is this? This is equal to 0, so this is, so e i k coordinate is equal to zero if uh, i is not equal to k and it's equal to one if i is equal to k, right? This vector is zero everywhere except at uh, the k place, right? So this is then nothing but the sum k equals from zero to n minus 1 of x e i times vector e i. 
So in the usual basis, the same formula holds. And this is really the crucial formula that contains 80% of digital signal processing, right? Simply any vector is obtained as a linear combination of the basis vectors with coefficients that are simply projections of that vector to that <laughs> coordinate axis, right? So if you have a vector here and you project it orthogonally here, right, this here will be the length of this will be simply x ei if this is the direction of vector ei, right? So simply, every vector is then sum of these components, right? So component in direction of the first coordinate vector, component in the direction of this coordinate vector, and finally, component along the direction of this vector, right? So everything is geometric and totally intuitive. Are you with me with this? Great. So, but then we say this might not be the most useful basis, right? So we came up with a fancy basis. Let's call it F for Fourier. And what is this basis? Well, this basis consists of the following vectors. So, uh, so the first vector is just vector of ones everywhere, right? Then the second vector is first coordinate is one. The second coordinate is e to the power i, 2 pi divided by n, right, times uh, uh, 1 uh, e to the i, 2 pi uh, divided by n times 2, right, and so forth, at the end you have e to the i 2 pi divided by n times n minus 1. That's the second vector. And then the next vector is again 1. And then e to the i 2 pi divided by n <coughs> times 2 times 1, right? Then e to the i 2 pi divided by n times 2 times 2 all the way to e i 2 pi divided by n uh, uh, times 2 times uh, n minus 1 and so forth the very last vector will be 1 e to the i times 2 pi divided by n times n minus 1 times 1 and then you will have the same here but times 2 and so forth, right? So if we uh, simply denote um, e to the i 2 pi divided by n by omega n, right, then this basis f has a very simple form. It consists of all uh, vectors that are of the form 1 uh, omega n omega n squared omega n to the power n minus 1. Oh, we forgot the first one. The first one here is just 1, 1 all the way to 1 because what is this? This is actually, this vector is just omega n to the power 0, omega n 
uh, to 0 times 1, omega n to 0 times 2, and so forth, right? So it is consistent with this. And of course, the very last one will be 1 omega n to the power n minus 1, omega n to the power n minus 1 times 2, all the way to omega n to the power n minus 1 times n minus 1. Right? And then we verified that this is an orthogonal basis, and if we divide each coordinate by square root n, then we get, in fact, an orthonormal basis. Right? Uh, so, uh, why are, is this basis so interesting? Well, for the following reason. If we introduce complex exponential of uh, k complex exponential <coughs> of a time variable t as the following um, cosine 2 pi divided by n times k times t right so that's cosine of this, plus i times sine 2 pi divided by n times k times t, right? So these are, they are called the complex sinusoids, right? Then you can see that um, each of the base vectors, right, you can see that the uh, vector, for example, 1 omega n to the k omega n to the k times 2 omega n to the k times 3 all the way to omega n to the power k times n minus 1. This vector is nothing but the sequence of samples of this function at, co at uh, integers, right? So this is just s i k at zero, s i k at one, all the way to s i uh, k at n minus one, right? So if we uh, represent our vector x in this basis, uh, right? If we represent x as sum i equals from 0 to n minus 1 of, and these are projections um, of x, um, right, times, uh, uh, how did we call the basis vectors? Let's call them times uh, phi uh, k. Um, right? Where, what is uh, uh, phi k? Uh, this is the vector phi k. In fact, if we divide it, uh, so phi k is this vector divided by um, square root of n. Um, uh, what we put it underneath here? Square root n, square root n, square root n, square root n and here also square root n. So here we will also inherit this. Uh, or we could have put uh, square root in front of here, it doesn't matter. Square root n, right? So if you represent uh, your vector in this form, this would essentially correspond to the following. Now, uh, assume that vector uh, x is actually a sequence of samples 
of a signal uh, f of t. So essentially what this says is that we have represented f of t, uh, we have approximated f of t with precisely this linear combination where this is just, uh, oops, I forgot the sum, <coughs> is the sum when k equals from 0 to n minus 1 xk hat um, uh, times sik of t, right? So this is equal to sum k equals from 0 to n minus 1 of this function, which in a more compact form is written as i 2 pi divided by n times k times t. So it's x hat e to the i, um, uh, sorry, let's write it in, uh, so xk, uh, and then instead of this, I will write e to the i 2 pi divided by n times k times t. So we approximated our signal as a linear combination of complex sinusoids of these discrete frequencies. Right? Of course, how do we find xk hat? You remember that xk hat uh, is simply projection of x to phi k, right? which is uh, simply sum when, uh, say, m goes from 0 to n minus 1, xk times uh, uh, e to the minus i, because the scalar product is involves complex conjugation on the second coordinate, right? 2 pi divided by n times uh, k, Oops, let me put here xn times uh, uh, n, right? Which we call, uh, which we call, so we call this sequence x0 hat up to xn minus 1 hat. We call it discrete Fourier transform of a sequence x. So you approximate f of t as a sum of sinusoids, right? And this equality, this approximation is actually exact. So uh, f of m is exactly equal to this sum k equals from 0 to n minus 1 xk hat e to the i 2 pi divided by n times k times n, right? It's exact on integers for m equals from 0 up to n minus 1. And this is the importance of these bases because these bases allow us, us to do approximate what's called spectral analysis. Why spectral analysis? Because it tells you for each of complex exponentials, which are just complex sinusoids. You see, if your original sequence was real, uh, the imaginary parts here would cancel out, right? Um, now, uh, what, uh, let's look again at this formula here. And uh, write it in tiny little bit different way. Okay, no. You've forgotten all the square root n. <coughs> oh, square root n. Where did I? Thank you very much. Matt, as usual, is alert. Where did I miss? Here is uh, square root n. You know, sometimes people just keep it on the inverse side of transform. Uh, and 
Okay, here square root n to normalize. And another one. Which one? Ah, the one on the bottom, yes. Okay. Now, this you can see a little bit different way. You can say that f of t is approximated as sum. And now, instead of xm, I will put absolute value of xm times e to the i times the argument of xm. What is uh, this? Let me just remind you, if you have any complex numbers z, you can always write it as its absolute value times its phase e to the i arg uh, z, right? So uh, this, if this is your complex vector z, then of course this is the absolute value of z, and this angle here is the arg of z. Right, and then you can see real part will be cosine of the arg, and imaginary part will be sine of the arg. Right, times e divided by square root n, so I don't forget it, it's i uh, 2 pi divided by n times m uh, <coughs> times t. And now we have two exponents, two guys of the same sort, so we can put them together, and here of course n goes from 0 to n minus 1. So this is sum, m goes from 0 to n minus 1, absolute value of xm times e to the power i, that multiplies the following. 2 pi divided by n times m times t plus arg of uh, xm. Right? And this tells the whole story now, you see, because this guy tells you the amplitude of the sinusoids, right? Because, because this will be, let's write it in expanded form, sum m equals from 0 to n minus 1, absolute value of xm times cosine 2 pi m divided by n times t plus i times sine 2 pi m divided by n oops, I forgot the, the phase uh, t plus uh, r xm, right, plus i times uh, sine 2 pi divided by n times m times t plus arg of uh, xm. Right, so this guy, when you take discrete Fourier transform and you take its absolute value, right, the module. It tells you precisely the amplitude, and if the signal is real, these guys will be complex conjugates of the guys xn minus m, and it will have as a consequence uh, the imaginary parts will cancel out, right? But why do we do it even for real signals in complex? Because here, you know, you have two functions, and if you differentiate them, cosine changes into sine and whatnot, it's real mess. Well, if you keep this exponential notation, differentiating this is kind of uniform, but you just take out the 2 pi of divided by n times n. Right? But the crux is that the amplitude tells you how much of each sine wave you have, and the argument tells you how much each sine wave is translated, right? 
So argument of the complex number has the property to shift these guys. Now, if you are encoding audio, human ear is essentially completely insensitive. This is not quite true on very low frequencies, but you, can, you would have to listen very hard in special circumstances to hear the difference on low frequencies. It's safe to say that human hearing is completely deaf for the phase. Because phase is just a slight shift in timing. You cannot detect milliseconds, right? Uh, and this is what gives uh, Fourier transform such a significance, uh, <coughs> right? Because it allows you to do spectral analysis uh, of uh, signals, right? Uh, so, um, now, uh, and of course, again, this is exact when these are integers, so exact for t equals 0 up to n minus 1, right? So this tells you why we do discrete Fourier transform, because we are after spectral analysis, okay? Now, uh, this is, so there is one incredibly, I mean, it's mysterious, uh, definitely phenomenon, that discrete things have identical counterpart in the continuous world. And you can almost perfectly, you know, every statement in continuous world has uh, counterpart in discrete world, and this happens not only for complex exponentials, but it happens, for example, for orthogonal polynomials, some of the orthogonal polynomials. So what would be the continuous uh, counterpart of this? Continuous counterpart uh, is uh, the fact that essentially, and this is to a shocking degree, uh, how broadly this is true, and it was proved uh, only in 1966 uh, by um, Leonard Carlson. If you have any function that is whose square is integrable, for all practical purposes, this means every function. Then, you, if it's periodic, so so f is. Uh, um, 2 pi periodic, then, and now I'll say, uh, um, uh, and let me then be really exact, uh, and uh, if uh, integral from minus pi to pi f of t where the uh, dt is finite, which of course in our case this will be always bounded functions and this will be a trivial. Uh, then the following series converges to f of t. Namely, every function can be represented as a sum when i equals from minus infinity to infinity, or actually, let me first do it as a trigonometric. So a sum n equals from 0 to infinity, a n cosinus uh, cosine of uh, um, uh, cosine of uh, uh, of uh, n t plus b n sine n t. So every periodic function, no matter how weird and asymmetric, uh, something that might look really crazy, right, is decomposable 
into the sum of cosines and sines. And in fact, you don't need both. <coughs> this is equivalent to say that uh, if this is equal, n equals from 0 to infinity of cn, uh, say cosine uh, nt uh, plus phi n. So you need just one, or you can take it sine, it doesn't matter, whatever is uh, your preference, right? So there are always constants, uh, so that no matter how weird function, it can be decomposed uh, into something that is, this is the fundamental, then the second one looks like this, and then they get busier and busier. So notice they are very uniform functions, so to speak. Nevertheless, they can synthesize back any function for as long as it's integrable, and this series will converge what's called almost everywhere. Uh, you know, you can have like very meager set of uh, uh, points uh, that you can cover with arbitrarily small intervals, but that's, for engineers, you can simply say uh, it just converges everywhere. Or almost everywhere, yeah. Well, maybe a few points doesn't. <coughs> okay. For example, points of discontinuities. So, <coughs> why would something like that be true? You see, people long suspected something like that be true, but only Fourier boldly uh, proposed that that's in fact what is true, that every function, continuous or discontinuous, can be represented as some of sines and cosines or just as some of pure harmonic oscillations, right? The reason how people arrive at that uh, is uh, by studying physics, right? Uh, if you analyze, the, and in fact, on, uh, that I put, uh, uh, I used to teach this in a much deeper way, but uh, people <coughs> have little enthusiasm for that, but in the lecture notes you can find uh, uh, this uh, on the website, they uh, called it additional material, you can see essentially this comes from this. Assume that you distort uh, a string, a wire. You make some kind of mold, you thread the wire through, and then you suddenly pull out the mold. And because the wire is under tension, it will, of course, start oscillating. But it's kind of logical to expect, no matter what initial distortion, what the oscillation has to be superposition of harmonics. Because the only oscillation that a string under tension can do is just superposition of sinusoids, right? So, and in fact, I think Bernoulli proposed that, but uh, I think Cauchy kind of rejected this, saying that is absolutely, this is insane to assume that any weird function can be represented by just trigonometric functions. And it took kind of for yes courage. Uh, his argument was kind of intuitive, but of course uh, he was proven in 1966 that uh, he was in fact right. Now, why would that be true if you are now mathematicians here? The reason why this is true is uh, remarkably simple. Well, of course it takes some uh, <coughs> argument to prove it, but essentially we will show this. <coughs> uh, every such function, let's first write it in complex form because it's so much easier to deal. Uh, uh, n is equal from zero to infinity. Ah, now because you need sines and cosines and to cancel out you have to sum from minus infinity to infinity. Cn e to the i uh, n uh, t. Okay, 
we, why would this be true? The reason is, again, this. There is nothing more to it than the very same thing that we did. Namely, uh, if we introduce uh, uh, a scalar product on uh, two pi periodic functions um, as f dot product g equals 1 over 2 pi integral from minus pi to pi f of t g of t conjugate in case it's complex dt then Functions, uh, let's call them uh, again uh, functions, how shall we call them? Psi n of t equals e to the i uh, n t uh, form an orthonormal basis. <clears throat> so the reason why this is true, and then as a consequence also this, is that cosine nt and sine nt taken together for all n from 0 to infinity, this collection of functions is a set of orthogonal vectors if you define a scalar product in this way. So the reason why such a decomposition holds is simply because these guys form an orthonormal basis and thus any vector from this space can be represented as some as a linear combination of basis vectors. Right? So why how do we show that, okay, let's move now again to this side of the board.